Hey guys, welcome back to The Real Estate Monopoly. This is Kerwin. And this is Kenneth Donis. And we are the Donis Brothers. And today we are here talking about common real estate investing misconceptions yeah. uh, that we've had when we first started, but also things that we've been taught by our mentors that other people don't seem to really understand and grasp. Um, so let's just get right into it. Jeffrey's yeah. obviously not here today, but we he's here in spirit. Yeah. And we miss him. No, he's fine. Um, yeah. So first things first, the, one of the first misconceptions that we learned when we were first getting into real estate was that investing long-term, holding property long-term, we, we were taught that that was very important. Uh, can you maybe, can you just explain why it's wrong to invest uh, for natural appreciation and also define what natural appreciation is? Yes, so simply put, uh, natural appreciation is really just banking on appreciation over time, right? So assets usually tend to appreciate over time. Real estate tends to appreciate over uh, just whatever amount of time that you hold it. So that's just natural appreciation over time right mm -hmm. so you're not necessarily forcing it it's just just happening naturally yeah absolutely and so flipping flipping is something a lot of people do yeah, flipping, uh, we yeah. did a flip when we were in the single family space and i would say there's a lot of people that would consider that investing yeah. do you consider flipping a house investing if not or if yes why well I, I, mean, I would say maybe it's a different type of investing but it's not it doesn't usually have the same investment um potential and return well, maybe we're not doesn't return. have the same function as an investment, the same opportunity as, as longer term investing has. Right. So you don't necessarily get to capture certain things whenever you're just flipping. I guess we also have to define what investing is in the context of this conversation. I would say investing is holding an asset, particularly a real estate property long term mm. that is producing cash flow. Yeah, correct. So if uh, it is cash flowing, meaning that you're getting more money every month than you're spending on expenses and maintaining the property. Yeah. Then flipping would not fit into that definition because a you're not holding it long term and you're also not going to be cash flowing you're more banking on natural appreciation whether that and is that considered forced because you're actually improving the condition of the property for flipping uh so it, it depends the only reason i w it is forced appreciation because most flippers buy it at a certain price below and they're already calculating in their repair costs so it is a form but the only thing is it's it's based off of, it's a little bit more risky because it is based off of what other properties are, are, are selling for in the area. And that can change significantly yeah. and very quickly as we've seen lately. Absolutely. And so that's why we would say like, it's a good vehicle to make money, but I wouldn't consider it an opportunity to build wealth. Like yeah. you're not building wealth. How, what, what is the difference between building wealth and making money in real estate? Maybe just to clarify that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think usually wealth whenever you say the word wealth it kind of comes along with assets and whenever you're holding assets i mean you're usually holding these in your portfolio for a longer period of time so if you're just constantly flipping these properties you're making a lot of money which i mean you can make you know million dollars few million dollars a year but in order to make wealth i think you have to actually hold on to these and actually be able to pass on something to the next generation or your wherever you're passing it on to so i think Absolutely. that would be my definition i guess i like that and we're all about time freedom. We always like to talk about that. And I think for a lot of us in, in, in the world, I mean, money is important, but time is the most valuable asset we have. Yes. And that's the beauty of passive investing and not just about passive investment, but passive income and cash flowing real estate is because it allows you to earn your money, your, your time back and not really necessarily have to work for that money because it's going to be your, your properties will generate money yeah. without you really having to actively work for it. And that's why it's, we think it's so important. That's why our definition of investing and in wealth is cash flow mm -hmm. and passive income, yeah. because that is what will truly get you your time back. You don't have to work for you, your Correct. money. Yeah. Um, now I, I did want to talk about, cause we talked about wealth, right? So we didn't start out wealthy. And I think that's another misconception. A lot of people think you need yeah. to be wealthy when you first get into real estate. Um, we used to think that like, Oh, I'm, I need to make a lot of money in my job or, uh, just make a lot of money and have it already before I get into real estate. Of course, it is easier if you have a ton of money to work with from the beginning. Yeah. But it, I would say a lot of people start out with little to no money at the beginning. I would say, like I mean, average. even before then, I would say a lot of people don't even think. I mean, I can even think personally back to a time where I didn't even think about making more money. Like I would just go to work and okay, like, Hey, you know, I made a $400 paycheck this week or whatever. Right. I wouldn't even think like, how can I make more money? Like I didn't think about that because I knew one, I guess I wasn't seeking to do that. And I didn't know that I could, you know, potentially put myself in a position where I could go out and make money. You mean make more money than you're... just in general. Okay. Well, my point is because most people will go get a job and then like have a, have a paying job and that's kind of the cap of what they can make. 
Whereas with real estate, and a lot of people think that with real estate, you need to have a lot of money a lot or of high, money, yeah. high paying job before you get into real estate. And my point is you don't need that. You can start with little to no can, money. Yes. Of course, it's harder, but you can leverage other types of capital, whether that's your network or your time. Like yeah. I said, time is the most valuable thing. Um, so there's different ways to get into real estate. Uh, when there are some investment opportunities that are going to be more expensive too, like yeah. most passive investment opportunities in apartment syndications, which is what we do. Those are going to be a little more expensive uh, in terms of like the barrier to entry. But yes. we've also bought properties with little to no money out of pocket up front. Yeah. Besides like attorney fees with seller financing, which we have uh, made a video about before the creative finance strategies that we use. But yeah. Pace Morby is a really good resource. P-A-C-E Morby is a really good resource when it comes to creative financing and learning that. So he's just proof that like you don't need a lot of money going out. Do you have anything else to like add to the misconception or to kind of debunk that, that you need a lot of money starting out? Yeah, I mean, there's, like my brother said, there's several people out there that started from no money and, and really just started hustling. So you can start with wholesaling. Um, you can probably even start with flipping properties. Uh, there's even people that have started in apartment syndication as an apartment syndicator with no money, little or no money, right? I mean, depending on what size asset, I'm sure, but... There are options out there for sure. Absolutely. And also like another way is you could find somebody that has the money and they could bring the money as like a JV if it's a smaller real estate partner property. with them, yeah. Or if it's even in a larger apartment, you can just find a way to bring that person value. And the way you meet these people is at conferences and events. Mm -hmm. Obviously that might cost money depending on where you are and what event it is, but we're just listening. We've done videos on these kind of topics before. You can look back um, and, and find them if you really are interested in learning about how to get into real estate with little to no money. But the point I'm trying to make is you don't need a lot of money to get in. That's a misconception. Of course, it yeah. makes it easier, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, also, so there is another, I don't want to say it's a misconception because it is true. In general, investing in real estate is going to involve risk because every investment involves risk. Yeah. But would you say, and this is kind of like a timely question too, would you say right now it is too risky to invest in real estate? No, I would say, I mean, there are certain instances where, you know, people just don't know what they're getting into. So I, I would say with any investment, you just have to do some research into the market or, you know, whatever that stocks or whatever you're investing in, but specifically real estate, do some research on the market, do some research on the prices, know when to buy, know when not to buy. Um, but I, I would say, I mean, most of the time it's a physical asset and, and, and you can always rent it out to produce more money. So, it, you know, it's like not like other asset classes where you can literally lose everything. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can make your mortgage payment and you're not in negative cash flow, you should be fine. Absolutely. And I would say if you're an investor, then you kind of have to accept that there's going to be risk involved. So I, I think the question yeah. is, are you an investor or not? Because if you're going to, if you say, okay, I am an investor, then it's a question of not whether or not I should invest, but what should I invest in? Mm. And so if you're looking at your options, let's say you choose the stock, that's, I would argue, more risky than real estate. Yes. And there's also a lot of factors you can't control. When it comes to real estate, you yes. can control a lot of the factors to help mitigate and control and lower that risk. So of course there's going to still be risk, but you can rely on the physical tangible asset that is real estate. Yes. Rely on the cash flow, like you mentioned, that's going to be coming in every month. Whereas the stock market is going up and down almost yeah. every day. And you have Bitcoin, no, same thing. I mean, those yeah, are and you have no, no say in those things. Right. So, I mean, like with, you know, for example, let's just take a house. You can buy a house. You can rent it to a single tenant. You can do short term rentals. Right. That's now a thing. And you can make a lot of money doing it. You can maybe even do like hospitalization for like um, halfway houses or there's so many different or elderly home. There's so many different other things that you can do with it that you can't do with other asset classes like for example stocks or bitcoin those things are just emotion based if everyone is selling and if, if there's fear in the market people are going to sell and that affects you directly yeah unfortunately but with real estate it's not really emotion like someone doesn't just say i don't I, i'm just going to sell my house today it actually takes a little bit longer which you know it could potentially be a downside because it's not as easy to sell but i think that's an upside because it's not liquid and you don't really want to be liquid in towns in times of downturns and even within real estate, I think there's different levels to the emotional involvement because with single family, you can kind of sell uh, within 30 days. And of course, you're still going to think it a little more, of the time, yeah. but wholesaling is kind of proof that you can make an emotional sale. Uh, a lot of people, I, I, we always were aware that with houses, people were more emotionally attached than with apartments, which is why we like apartments a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes more time to sell, but also you're going to deal with 
different kind of, you're dealing with investors as well when you're buying an apartment versus with seller. It's like, it might be their mom's house that they were emotionally attached to. So I would just say that there is like, of course it takes longer to sell a house than it is a stock, but there's even, it's even harder to sell an apartment, which kind of adds that layer of of, uh, reliability and, you know, and and, and I would say not necessarily no risk, but more security Mm -hmm. and assurance there. I agree. Yeah. Um, this is another one. Of course, we're living proof that this one is, we're going to debunk it right now, but do you need a college degree to invest in real estate? No, actually, um, no. Was that ever something you thought? Because now I'll give you a story. There was a time when my friend, um, I was talking to their parents and they said, uh, when you're sitting at those tables, people are going to want to see a college degree uh, on your resume when you're like investing in real estate. And this was before we even started wholesaling. And I was, I've, of course, I, I was considering leaving school. I think I had, I had decided to take a break from school at that point. And I was, that was, that was one of my limiting beliefs. I was nervous uh, and, and kind of like, oh, wait, maybe, maybe they're right. Um, and of course, in hindsight, I know that isn't the, the case. I yeah. spoke with mentors and um, they all said, no, brokers don't really look at your, your degree. Of course, it can't hurt in terms of like if your investor wants to know if you have a finance degree, it can help with credibility. But I don't think not having one necessarily hurts you if you have all the other things. Yeah. Well, I, I just put it this way. I mean, w- the answer is no. You don't need it. If you go to the bank and ask for a million dollars to buy a property, they're not going to say, where's your MBA or your bachelor's degree. They're going to say, what is your net worth? What is your liquidity? And what is your experience? They don't care about anything else. So no, actually there's a lot of people in real estate that were C average students or even D students in school, but now they're worth a ton of money because they, they get different principles, right? So I mean, school, there are certain principles to school, but there's also certain principles to business that don't correlate with each other in which I think business is more applicable to the real world. And that's really like when you get to learn more business and real world experiences, that's more valuable than anything else. Yeah. And I would say a college degree, a lot of times can help you make up for the lack of experience. Like yes. it kind of can, you know, it can circumvent the lack of experience that you might have. But if you have a partner or have a mentor who is partnering with you on deals or helping you or just more experienced investor, then you can leverage them because they're on your team. Yes. So that's another way I would say is like a different way to kind of do check those boxes that you might not have when you're first starting out in terms of like the liquidity and the experience and the track record and things like that. Yeah, I agree. Um, so people also, and I think when I was first like hearing about real estate, I, I also had some, uh, some older mentors and people I respected. They said that, Oh, having a property is a lot of headache and it's mm. too stressful. And I, I don't know necessarily if that's a misconception of being a landlord. It's, it's not worth the headache. I don't know. I, I, I want to know what you think. Do you think mm. that that is true? And I guess it doesn't de- depend on the kind of asset you're talking about in terms of like apartment versus single family. Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I would say, I think people like hype up the fact that if you own an asset, like it's going to go so terribly wrong when in fact, like we have a house that we still own in Fayetteville and the tenant pays rent. They don't reach out to us for anything. Everything is fine there, you know, and there's no headaches, you know? Mm. Yes. I mean, occasionally maybe something can occur, but it's like, I mean, it's like you're making money without having to work for it. So like, what, what do you expect? You know, yeah. you're going to have to do something once in a while. But I would say usually I think there's like a really, really huge negative connotation to owning a property. Some people think that it will just come with a whole bunch of headaches and this and that. But as long as you do a good tenant screening and make sure that they're not just like some crackhead off of the street and they're not going to ruin everything, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I think it's all about the vetting process before because, of course, it's the resident that's going to yeah. be causing the headaches and the property if it's in bad condition. And like, it, also, we're not handymen, so we wouldn't yeah. even I wouldn't even know how to do certain things anyway. Um, so I would call we would call someone. So I think when it comes to that, it would just matter how much cash flow you have from the property mm-hmm. because if it needs repairs and the cash flow doesn't cover it, you're not going to have to come out of pocket. Now, when it comes to a multifamily property, can you just briefly explain why that? misconception doesn't even apply. Yes. So with multifamily, it's different because you have a property management company that's pretty much managing the day to day stuff. And then you'll have an asset manager. So there's multiple people on your team. The asset manager is designated. So they're the ones that's going to handle the headaches because there are always headaches that come. This is a business, right? Uh, Apartments are business. So you, you have to make sure that you're operating well and managing well. 
And so there's a designated person that'll take on the headaches. But as an owner, usually you're not that person and you have someone that you've hired out to handle that role. So whenever you're buying apartments, usually as an owner, you're, you're really just knowing, like having the knowledge that this is a good investment, good area, good asset, and this is something that you want to do. And then after you buy it, obviously you have to make sure it's still it's staying on top of your, your employees. But as an owner, usually you're, it's not as uh, hands on. So you're fine. Yep. Absolutely. Now uh, I, I, we just have so many awesome points that I want to kind of, not awesome, but interesting misconceptions that I really want to debunk. So let's just keep pushing. Yeah. Another one that I think is extremely timely is uh, the argument that there are certain times to buy real estate and then there are certain times to wait on the sidelines. Mm. Um, and I guess that would feed the idea that you can time the market and there is timing is everything in real estate. That's, and I don't know. I think I, there's, there's good arguments on both sides. I'll, I'll present the argument for why you should maybe wait on the sides and then you argue against. But I would say the reason that might not be a necessarily a misconception and why that might be true is because if, of course, the prices are inflated and they're too high and you buy at a really high price and you overpay and the, the, the economy crashes or whatever and the property value goes down, then you're going to end up being negative upside down. Uh, upside down. But that would be that would be essentially saying that you bought the property for natural appreciation, assuming it was going to increase in value that I don't even know if I would consider that investing because we consider investing, like I said earlier, that it has to be cash flowing. Hmm. So if the property is cash flowing, then of course you might not be able to sell it when you wanted to, but you'll still be cash flowing, which at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Hmm. So with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also say you obviously don't want to catch a falling knife, right? So, you know, with houses, you definitely have to be a little bit more careful because, you know, you could buy high and unless you're looking to, hold this property long term. Um, but if you're looking for short term, it, it could be, you know, you can catch it at the wrong time and it could, you know, not, you might not be able to sell when you were expecting to, but usually um, as long as you're able to make the mortgage payment, like my brother said, that is the biggest concern whenever it comes to a downturn that you're able to pay your debt, because if you don't pay your debt, you lose the property. But if you can hold on to it, it'll keep paying you. You'll still keep cash flowing. And then eventually real estate prices, even after the OA crash, they have gone up over what prices were at in 08 and they always tend to to do that so even if they were to fall 20 30 40 percent as long as you can hold it for long term 10 20 30 years you're fine you will eventually be able to capture that um the, the equity that you might have lost but obviously with any investment you just want to make sure you're studying the market um just the area make sure it's a good asset and just make sure that some it's something that you would want to hold on to long term. So a lot of people kind of to build off of that, a lot of people would probably think that because prices of houses are rising and just real estate in general is rising, it's not a good time to, to buy real estate right now, especially interest rates. What would you say to someone that says that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, prices are really high and in certain markets, they've gone, they've increased like 50% in the last four years, which is ridiculous. People that are saying that prices are increasing in real estate right now, and this might not be a great time to buy real estate because houses, the price of houses and apartments are increasing along with interest rates. Why do you think it's still a good time to be looking for opportunities? Not necessarily buying, but looking for opportunities. Yeah. Well, I would always say it's good to be looking one so that you're active, you're familiar with what's going on. If you see a house right now, for example, in our neighborhood, I'll see houses, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, I would, you know, when I see a house for sale, I would look at it. They just flipped it. Okay. Boom. 500,000, 450, 450, whatever it is. Right. It's on the market. And then I'll check in a week later. It's already pending for sale. Nowadays I'm seeing houses stay on the market more, although I'm not buying anything. I'm just keeping up with what's going on. So now I'm seeing houses stay on the market longer. They're getting price reduced a lot more mm -hmm. and they're not selling at what they were selling that, at, that you know, six, eight months ago. Yeah. So I think just, just continuing to look, although you're not, may not be buying constantly either underwriting or just kind of being aware of what's going on in the market is very important. Yeah. So I've asked this question a lot to a lot of people that have come on the real estate monopoly podcast, which is our podcast and show. And they often say you're either an investor or you're not. And so investors are always looking for opportunities. They're not necessarily always buying, but they're always yeah. looking. And some of the smartest, uh, most ex experienced and successful investors that we've had the privilege of connecting with have said that 
the, the, the key to them to really making sure they're successful and maintaining and protecting their real estate asset and portfolio and their investors money is to just stick to their principles. Mm. So you stick to your principles. Yeah. And of course, like I said, you might not be buying, but there's a potential for opportunities to be available. Like you might find a property or a seller that's willing to negotiate and adjust, you know, but you, you can't find an opportunity when you're not looking. Yeah. So that's why it's important. Like, I think what you're saying is just stay out there. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you're not looking, then you won't find anything. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this is like a flip side of it. And I think for us, it's kind of common sense of why this isn't true, but some people might think this um, because they're seeing the prices go up in the stores and the groceries. So they might think right now investing in real estate is not good because inflation is going crazy. Yeah. What would you say to someone that says that? And I can start, I guess for one, that's actually even more reason to invest in real estate because if you're happy if you're letting your money sit in the bank, then as the prices go up, your dollars can buy less because the value of the dollar is going down. Your purchasing power is going down. Therefore, if you park it in a inflation hedging asset like real estate, which pretty much just means that as the price of everything else goes up, the price of your real estate goes up as well. So we can kind of ride that wave mm -hmm. and you can really protect your money and your capital and your hard earned money from the impacts of real estate or of inflation. Yes. Agreed. And, and the way you think about it, whenever you buy real estate, you're, you're using debt to, you're using, you're leveraging debt. So you're buying something that's worth a hundred thousand with 20, $25,000 of actual money in that time. But in the future, you're still paying off that, you know, with, with inflation going up, you're paying off that mortgage with money that is less valuable if that makes sense mm -hmm. and yeah totally so you know real estate there's not many assets that you can leverage i think you're able to start doing that in certain uh maybe in stocks and maybe i think in crypto but i think that's a little bit more riskier because you know there's yeah yeah like we said earlier in general i think real estate is more of a it, it still involves risk but it's not going to be as volatile which just means it, it doesn't fluctuate in terms of value as much as stocks um, so with that being said, we've covered a lot of misconceptions today. If you guys have any other questions about misconceptions, we could even do it part two because I had a long list, but we're running yeah. out of time. Let us know if you like this episode and if you got any value, uh, if you want us to continue with a part two, let us know as well. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure you guys leave a comment and a review down below. Kenneth, where can they find us? Excuse me. You guys can find us at Donis Brothers on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and... Yep. And then also, if you guys want to check out our it. playbook, it's www.donisinvestmentgroup.com backslash checklist. It's a three-step passive investing checklist. You guys make sure you check that out. Let us know what you think. Connect with us. Reach out. Let's get out there and take action, guys. I hope yeah. you guys have a great rest of your day. And remember one thing. It always starts with a dream. So have a good rest of your day and uh, God bless.